You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast. And we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Vyadaris, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not uh, as simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many more know, doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. Well, we're now just a couple days away from the Grand Ole Opry, also known as Thursday Night Football. You didn't know it was known as Thursday Night Football, but it is. That's why you come here. I educate you on things you should know if you're a grown-up. And not a small, stupid child. Speaking of Kansas City Chiefs and Detroit Lions, I wanted to start off with something that I did just a little bit for uh, for fun. I saw somebody else do something kind of similar, and I thought, I wish it had said this, and I thought, no, I'll just go do it myself. If you follow me on Twitter, you probably have already seen this. But, look, we know, for example, the Packers struggle week one. Right? This isn't an unknown thing. But I wanted to put some kind of data behind it, especially going into week one. And and it's not necessarily something I want to do every week. You know, looking at week seven is somewhat irrelevant. But the problem with week one is there's a lot of variables that come into play week one that don't necessarily come into play at other times. I mean, every team has a lot of different variables, right? Some teams struggle during prime time or this, that, or the other. So I just want to flesh out what teams sort of dominate week one. What teams completely crap the bed week one? And then I want to look at these specific matchups and see where the biggest discrepancies are. One of the things that I learned is that the Kansas City Chiefs, who are freaks among freaks to begin with, and I would encourage you to go to Twitter, follow me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy, but just so you can see this chart. If you didn't know better, you'd probably miss the Kansas City Chiefs on here because they're so far away from everybody. But essentially what I did is I I looked at EPA per play for each team. I feel like that's a pretty solid metric. It's just looking at how how many points did you add in a given play. And if you don't know what I mean by that is when you complete a play, or there's a certain estimate based on historical data of how many points you're probably going to score on this drive, right? So if you're looking at like a Vegas thing, they'd give you odds on, you know, plus or minus you know, two points on this drive or whatever. Then after you complete a play, there's going to be a new calculus. Did you go positive or did you go negative? For the Kansas City Chiefs, on average, so the Green Bay Packers are actually the second highest average season EPA per play over the last five years. It's just over .05. The Chiefs are at like .13. In fact, let me see if I can get you an exact number here. Got so much junk over here. So yeah, they are .135. So again, the second best team is Green Bay. At point zero five, just think about it as five. The Chiefs are at thirteen and a half. You could round up to fourteen. The gap is unbelievable. So from the Jets at like negative point one, which is crazy, they go <laughs> they go negative, and quite a few teams do. From negative point one to point zero five is every single team. Then the Kansas City Chiefs are point one three. So that's just average per season what i wanted to see is what is the difference comparing yourself to yourself 
between what you do throughout the season compared to what you do week one. Some teams are going to be better week one than they're than they are generally. Some teams are going to be worse than they are generally. The Kansas City Chiefs are also off the chart in the other direction. So the second best team in terms of how they perform week one is Baltimore. Baltimore is at .156. Probably not super surprising for a couple reasons. Number one, Lamar's healthy week one. Number two, the Baltimore Ravens have a really good reputation. They're a very disciplined football team. That has been their reputation. Now, you think about New England, you think about Baltimore, you think about Pittsburgh, you think about Kansas City. Generally very established teams with established coaches that, you know, no nonsense, etc., etc. Been doing this a while. They're at .156, and they're pretty far ahead of everybody else. In fact, there's only three teams above .1. New Orleans is the other one. Kansas City is at almost .3. They're at .28. Most teams are under, again, just think about it as one. Under one. Almost every single team is under one. The Chiefs are almost at three. But think about how crazy that is in general. The Kansas City Chiefs, on average, dominate the league with an average EPA per play of .13. That is miles ahead of everybody else. .13. Call it 13. Call it 14. But on week one, they're all the way up to 28 Again, the Packers during the season, which is the second highest, are at 5. The Chiefs in week 1, 28. Picture how crazy that is. So the Kansas City Chiefs are the best team in football. But they're beyond the best team in football on week 1. They're almost three times as good as the second best team on average. And they're twice as good as that on week 1. That's freaking unbelievable. Here's the other thing to keep in mind. Again, I didn't want to just look at each team individually. I wanted to look at how these teams compare to their upcoming opponents. Who are they playing? They're playing the Detroit Lions. Now, you can look at it just in general, right? Kansas City is at 13 on average. Detroit is at, I mean, they're at less than one. Like point, well, let's get exact numbers here. Detroit was actually 12th lowest at negative 0.02. Just call it negative two. So in an average game, the Lions are negative two, the Chiefs are 13 and a half. But on week one, the Kansas City Chiefs are at 28, and the Lions are the fourth worst team at negative nine. So the gap between the fourth worst week one team, this is just in general, not not compared against itself. It goes the Jets, then the Bills, then the Falcons, then the Lions. Fourth worst week one team compared to, by a mile, the best Week 1 team, which is the Kansas City Chiefs. Again, this is over the last five years. And, of course, there's a lot of things in there. I mean, there could be, like, one or two games throwing this whole thing off. There could be coaching changes and all that stuff. This is just a snapshot. But sh- but but this is, by far, the biggest discrepancy in favor of, of any one team, and it's Kansas City. And, and, and just to kind of put that into perspective, looking at the five biggest discrepancies by game, Chicago Green Bay is sixth, so they didn't quite make the cut. But um, putting it into simplistic numbers here, Buffalo, um, the Jets are over Buffalo, 10.9. Carolina over Atlanta is 11. Minnesota over over Tampa Bay, 11.8. New Orleans over Tennessee, 17.5. Kansas City over Detroit is 22. The gap between Week 1 Kansas City and Week 1 Detroit. It's actually a lot bigger than that because that's compared against itself. So... That's the first thing to take note of, because it's not just Kansas City against Detroit. It's Week 1 Kansas City, the team that is already the best team in football, but Week 1 is just astronomically better. The last thing in the world you ever want to do in a season is face the Chiefs Week 1, and Detroit is walking into that, and it's at home, and I didn't even break it down in terms of home and away. I figured that would be kind of pointless, because at best you're talking maybe three games out of five, or otherwise you can go back ten years, but now you're including just teams that don't exist anymore just for the sake of putting more information in. So it it seemed like a bad idea. You could look at it yourself if you wanted to, to kind of get a a closer look individually. And and maybe we'll do that before we look at this particular game. But this is a freaking buzzsaw that the, that the Detroit lions are walking into. Now the green Bay Packers, I mentioned this is the worst week one team. Now it depends how you look at it in terms of just um, EPA per play. They're actually the eighth worst. Chicago is worse, San Francisco, Cleveland, Detroit, Atlanta, Buffalo, and the Jets. Just in terms of how good was this team, they're the eighth worst 
on average over the last five years. But that wasn't the specific question I asked. The specific question that I asked in this particular case is, how much worse are you in week one compared to your standard? If you look at it from that standpoint, the Packers are the worst. And this really isn't like a, a good team, bad team thing. And that's the, the, the three worst teams week one in terms of how bad are you compared to your standard. Green Bay is the worst. Very, very close to that is the Buffalo Bills, Super Bowl contenders. And then third is the San Francisco 49ers. Kind of a, a little bit of a drop there if in, in terms of like whole numbers. Packers are 12.9, Buffalo 12.2, San Francisco 10.9. But still, those are the three worst teams in terms of how big of a drop-off is there. So when you compare the Green Bay Packers to the Chicago Bears, the Packers have a bigger drop-off from their own personal standard on week one. But just looking at it in whole, as a, as a whole, it's, it's basically a tie. How the Packers perform week one compared to how the Bears perform week one. With the Packers just slightly, slightly ahead. And so when you look at, at the data that we've been looking at in terms of the, the Packers slowly becoming more and more of the favorites, and I'm actually starting to think that I might be wrong about my projection that the Packers are going to be ahead. Let me just double check and make sure they haven't done that before I go on my little diatribe here. See what the latest numbers are. Yeah, so it's still minus one for the Bears, plus one for the Packers looking at um, the current odds. And it... It's very possible it may stay there. And the reason I say that, it, there, there's kind of two conflicting things that are that are working here. And it's funny because the bets are pouring in more and more and more for the Packers. So it was 50-50, then it was 51 the last time we talked. It's now 53% of the bets coming in for Green Bay. 79% of the money is on Green Bay. But it may stay there because I've been watching some of these more data-centric, you know, Vegas betting type shows on YouTube. And a lot of them are saying that the handicaps or the, the spreads for these teams... They'll have the Bears at like uh, minus 2.5, and they'll say something to the effect of, that's slanted in favor of the Bears. I actually have it at about minus 1 for Chicago. And they're all kind of saying that. They're handicapping it, or however you phrase that. I don't know. I like this stuff, but I hate freaking terminology. Is at minus 1, meaning most people seem to think where we are right now is where it should be. But again, there's going to be these two conflicting things. There's a question of where it should stand which seems to be about minus one. I think that's where a lot of like the, the big pro betters are going to have it at, meaning it should kind of stabilize there. But at the same time, as news begins to pour in more and more and more that the Packers are the better team, the Bears are a disgrace and all this stuff, you're just going to continue to see more and more and more money go into Green Bay. And then the question is, does the line move as a result of that big pile of money coming in? Or does it stabilize because Vegas recognizes that this seems to be about the right number? I don't know. That'd be a good... I, I, I got to get some people on here that know how this stuff works a little bit better. Be interested to know. Because a lot of people, again, will look at it and say, well, they just want it to be 50-50, so that's what's going to move the line. But that's not true. Again, you've, you've got... Whether you want either the money or the bets to be 50-50, I would assume you'd want the money to be 50-50. Right now, it's 79% Packers. And again, the Titans game, 97% of the money is on the Titans. Why in the world has it not flipped in terms of favoring the Titans more, and even 63% of the bets. You know, the Ravens, 71% of the bets are on the Ravens. So I don't know. I, I, I think it may stabilize about here, but we'll see. We'll see if the, the pressure continues as far as the Packers hype train and if the money continues to pour in for the Packers. I'd be interested even in, in doing a little bit of that, although I think it's illegal in the state of Wisconsin. I don't know. Seems like I'm pl I can play daily fantasy sports, but I can't bet on i don't i don't freaking know how this stuff works man it's letting me place bets so maybe it's confused i hopefully i'm not incriminating myself but uh, the the larger point here though is it's it's almost identical and i think a lot of what what i'm talking about here now is part of the calculation that's being put into this which is if you look at the packers and you look at the bears and how they perform week 1 it's actually quite similar and there's a lot of other variables, but the variables are largely unknown. And so the Packers are slightly better week one than the Bears are, just in terms of, you know, as a whole, as, as, as a just overall product. They're a better football team week one, but you're in Chicago. Then I wanted to look at one final thing, and this is just for the Green Bay Packers. I said, okay, so we know their season average, right? We got their baseline EPA, and we know that they're trash week one. But what happens after that? Is it a slow climb? Is it this? Is it that? 
So I looked at the average for every single week over the last five years and charted it against the average. So the worst week by far is week one. Like twice as bad as their second worst week. Do you want to know what really sucks? And, and I'll be honest, man. This is why I, I told you. When you look at EPA per play as a team, the Packers are the second best team. But man, you sure wouldn't know it watching the Packers over the last five years, would you? And the last five years, by the way, includes 2018. Five is arbitrary, but it's a good round number. I could have easily done less. The only reason I really didn't is because this wasn't really Packers-centric when I started it. You could go back and look at 2019 and, and get a kind of better idea of this new Gutekunst era. Whatever. Still, second best team over the last five years, including 2022, which wasn't great, and 2018, which was trash. Still dominant, though. Here's the problem. You know when else the Packers suck, aside from week one? The end of the season. There's a random bad week in week six. Don't know what that's about. Probably just has to do with a couple bad games throwing it off. You know the other two really bad weeks, though? Week 20, which is the final week. That's like the only time we've, we've gotten there. And week 18, the final week of the season. Week 18 and week 20. The two last games the Packers would have played. The start and the end. It doesn't matter that you're one of the best teams throughout the regular season. It doesn't matter when you end like crap. Week 20, the average EPA per play performance from the Green Bay Packers was negative .04. Now, I don't know the exact number, 0 .04, dot, 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 dot. In fact, let me, let me see if I can find it. I'm going to get an exact comparison. It's .0414, Milwaukee style. That's appropriate. The closest team in comparison would be the New York Giants. The, the three closest team are the Houston Texans, the New York Giants, and the Carolina Panthers. That is, the, the Giants would be the ninth worst team over the last five years. So the Packers, who are the second best team on average, became the 8th worst team week 20. Now yes, these are against tougher opponents, that's true. But you went from a top team to a bottom 10 team in week 20. That's the freaking problem. And again, I, I bring this up for all the people that say, well, we're, we were just a player away, we were a player away. Listen, I don't doubt that a player is going to help. You know, granted, if, if you cherry pick the one out of 40 players that actually would have been a major benefit in their first and second years. But you're not, you're not looking at this properly. This isn't like the Green Bay Packers were the Green Bay Packers in, in week 20 and it just wasn't good enough. That's not true. If the Packers were the Packers, they probably would have been good enough. The problem is that the Packers were not the Packers. The Packers were the second best team in football over those last five years. That's good enough. But when you become the Giants, when you become the eighth worst team in football or the ninth worst team in football, that's not good enough anymore. And I'm sorry, T. Higgins isn't going to fix that. The issue was not that the Packers are not good enough. The issue is that the Packers at the end of the season, week 20 or week 18, was not good enough. And week 18, by the way, was just slightly worse. So, so week one was our worst. Week 20 and week six were our second worst. And then week 18, final week of the season, was the next worst. In week 18, we are, ironically enough, where the Lions have been over the last five years. 12th worst team in week 18. The problem is how we ended the season. And listen, I'll, I'll just be completely honest with you. I know it's a, a touchy subject to blame Rodgers because he's not always the problem, although he was in every single instance with the exception of 2020. I distinctly remember Brett Favre being a very good quarterback until we got to the end of the season. Because guess what happens when you're old and you get to the end of the season? You don't hold up too well. You start to struggle. Look at what happened to Kirk Cousins, how his body was just broken by the end of the year. It's why you see guys like David Bakhtiari and Mercedes Lewis not really practice during the week because they need to preserve their bodies because they don't repair very well. This is part of the problem of trying to win at the end of the season with a guy like Aaron Rodgers. It's not to say it's impossible for him to be healthy and, and all this stuff, but it's just less likely that you're healthy because you're taking the bumps and bruises and your ability to regenerate and to heal is less. So the injuries start to compound. This isn't just a knock on Rodgers, oh, he's some piece of crap. This is just a reality. This is freaking biology. He's struggling more than just about anybody else. Now, granted, 
one of the losses was against freaking Tom Brady. But that's its own thing. His ability to... And, and, and he did start to fall off at the end. We saw some pretty... Especially in New England, some really ugly performances toward the end of the season. And again, that doesn't mean you can't stay healthy. But if you're taking some hits and if you're starting to see some bumps and bruises, you know, like Kirk Cousins did, it's just... It's really going to be hard to maintain a high level of play. And at the end of the day, the Packers really struggled at the end of the season. And so all it did was we had some really good regular seasons, but we just were not ready at the end of the season. We couldn't maintain it. We couldn't hold strong. Whether it was a lack of belief, uh, uh, compounding injuries, whatever it was, we just fell off. We started weak. We ended weak. That's it. That was the Green Bay Packers. That was the story of, of this era, which is the end of Aaron Rodgers' tenure. And I don't think that would ever change. We could keep Rodgers, and I think things would be great. We'd probably lose, well, we wouldn't lose week one if it's the Bears. But it would probably be a pretty ugly performance, because that's what it was every year. He wouldn't have come in for OTAs. He wouldn't have played in the preseason. He wouldn't have done any of the things he's doing for the Jets. So none of that would have been happening. It would have been a bad week one. We'd have had a good rest of the season. And at the end of the year, it would have just plummeted. It would have fallen off. It's just the way, it's just the pattern of things. It's the way it went. And so, you know, I mean, the, the, the team needs and has and will have a new identity. And we don't know what that is. It's going to have different positives. It's going to have different negatives. Some of it will carry over because some of the players are still here. The coach is still here. The GM is still here. But I, I genuinely believe we just have to learn this new team. We got to know what the team was before. We knew week one was going to be a struggle, right? We knew we'd bounce back. We also knew that there was a pretty good chance we were going to get knocked out of the playoffs at some point in embarrassing fashion. That's just the way it went. We knew that we struggled after bye weeks because the discipline was just garbage for this organization. So any time off was not going to be used properly and people are going to come back sluggish and stupid. And, um, you know, that's, that's the biggest problem I'm having right now is I don't know what to say because I don't know this team. I don't know what this team is. Even the things that I think probably could, would, should carry over, maybe they won't. I don't know. I don't know what this team is so i'm having a really hard time figuring out what to talk about you know even when you look at like we'll look at bears packers matchups it's like yeah fair enough and we, we can and we will do that but i just i don't know like what from a macro standpoint what are we trying to do what 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 should the bears try to do i saw somebody earlier talk about stop the run you know bears need to stop the packers rushing attack and it's like well that's fair I think that's a fair assessment. You you know that we have a good uh, couple of running backs. Um, you know that we had some success running against the Bears last time. You know that the Bears' defensive front is very questionable. But I don't know. I don't know the identity of this team. I don't know who the weapons are. I want to say Watson, but again, that doesn't seem to be the thing. I want to say Dobbs, but I don't know if he's going to play, and I don't know if what he did in the preseason is going to carry over into the regular season. Remember, he had a great preseason last year. Didn't necessarily translate. Now, you could say, yes, it did until his injury if you want, but maybe again it's all maybe i don't know maybe musgrave is the guy are we going to be more run heavy are we going to pass just as much or maybe more is this a play action thing is is pressure a major factor i don't even know we, we have a long way to go before we start to develop and notice trends things that seem to start happening will this team come out hot can they end strong can they maintain you know even even you look at the packers with their record in the second quarter the heck was that all about? I have no idea, but they dominated the second quarter. You know, uh, how good the Packers have been looking in the red zone. That would be huge if they can maintain that. Is that a thing? There's so Every team has things. Apparently the Kansas City Chiefs thing is, we're good, but frickin' week one, we're otherworldly. All right, cool. Good to know. Didn't know that. Now I know that. So I look forward to it, man. I, I, I do. And I, I swear, I, <laughs> I'm so desperate for this football game to start. If I was just being completely and totally honest with everybody, this podcast would be about 15 seconds long. We would do the intro, and I would say, I don't know, man, I just want to see it. You guys have a good rest of your day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Because that's how I feel about everything. I don't know. I just want to see it. I just need to see it. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what's going on. I don't know anything. I just want to watch the game. Please, Lord in heaven above, give me this game. I'm going to get a pack of Z-Quill. I'm going to pass out. And when I wake up, I'm going to drink more Z-Quil and I'm going to pass out. It's like in those video games where you just like, you know, keep doing like a save thing to fast forward a little bit. I'm just going to fast forward my life to Sunday. Nah, yeah, Thursday, have some ribs, pass out. <laughs> Lose a bunch of weight because I don't eat for a week. Aside from the ribs, I'm going to max out on some ribs, bro. So excited about it. 
Anyways, why don't we take a quick break? We'll come back and, um, well, we'll look at some more stuff. Shout out, by the way, to Mr. Carson Caldwell for jumping in on Patreon. Really, really do appreciate that. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. If you don't like the monthly stuff, which I understand, Venmo is Packernet Podcast. Please, oh, please, oh, please do me a favor and check out Old Southern Barbecue at oldsouthernbbq.com. As I mentioned before, they've got the rubs, they got the sauces. If you're in the area, sort of northwestern Wisconsin, definitely should stop into their uh, restaurant. But I actually talked to the good people at Old Southern Barbecue, and I said, so what is sort of the range as far as the catering is concerned? And essentially the answer I got is, if you're willing to pay for it, they're willing to bring it. I'm sure there are limitations to that, but it would be worth calling if you're even relatively in the area. And again, I can't think of a better football spread. If you're having a big party, if it's just you and your family or whatever, go ahead and fire up the Weber. Get you some Old Southern Barbecue rubs and sauces. Do it right. Make some ribs. I can't wait for my ribs, man. I want my ribs so bad. Anyways, why don't we take a quick break and uh, we'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you're here as in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not as uh, simple as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened up so many more doors. The show is called The The Deal. Deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. So as it stands right now, um, it is a consensus. Every single betting site has plus one for the Green Bay Packers. Usually there's some kind of fluctuation. It looks like most of the teams are kind of settling in, but that's leading me to believe that this is where it's going to end up. You know, everything is just kind of stopped. It's not, you know, some are at still two and a half, some are at one. So the, the trend continues down. The trending down has stopped and everybody else has caught up. And now it's just across the board. Everything is plus one Packers, minus one Bears. So I don't know if I'm going to be right about my prediction or not. I'm, I'm starting to think that this is just where it sits and this is where it'll stay, but we'll keep an eye on it. We'll see how this hype train takes off, and I want to keep an eye on the money as it continues to pour in, or has everybody kind of placed their bet and it's just going to be what it is. Either way, it's not a bad spot to be in. Again, we opened at two and a half. It, it had gotten to three points. It is now settled at minus one. Um, if you look at, for example... Numbers Fire, which Mr. Numberman uh, pointed me to, said it's a really good resource. I'm doing everything in my power to resist paying for this subscription because I don't need it. I don't need it. I don't. I have a subscription addiction, by the way. I just realized right now. The closest win... They give win probabilities for each game. The closest win probability of any game is Packers-Bears. So there's a 76% win probability for the Chiefs, 59 for the Saints, 65 for the Jaguars, on and on and on. 76 for the Washington over Arizona. There's a couple other really close ones here. 
54 for Dallas, 54 for Denver, 54 for the Chargers, uh, 56 Eagles over Patriots, which seems closer than I would have expected. Kind of curious what's behind that. Uh, 54 for the Steelers, but 52.0% they have the Chicago Bears winning. And so again, that kind of ties into me not thinking it's going to go too much further because I think the hype only can carry you so far. It pushed the, the, the money into one column. But I think a lot of the data, whatever that may be, these are massive computers that pump in massive amounts of data that come to different conclusions. I think it has it right about here, which is the bears by a hair is where I think it's not saying it's my prediction or anything else. This is just what the numbers are spitting out. So minus one, minus 0.5 is, is I think probably, probably where it's going to stay. Anyways, other news and notes. Uh, Freaking Brian Burns, I guess, is sitting out, so I gotta have a heart attack about him, too. He's not a massively elite football player, but I still just don't want him going to Chicago or any of the other teams. There is probably a more intelligent part of me. Brian Burns is an edge rusher for the Carolina Panthers, by the way. Pass rusher. Um, there is probably somewhere deep down a more intelligent part of me that realizes that he's going to get paid more than he's worth. That's exactly the issue in Carolina right now, if I had to guess. He wants top pass rusher money. He is not not a top pass rusher. Brian Burns last year ranked 67th via PFF with a 64.5 PFF grade. Now, he did have a 71.3 um, uh, pass rush grade, which is the most important thing. But even that ranked 36th. So... I mean, look, he's fine. He's going to generate some pressures. He had 68 pressures, which is a lot. Uh, that ranked uh, 12th, and that was on 525 attempts, 13 sacks. But honestly, it's it's very similar to a guy like Yannick Ngakwe. He's a slightly better version of Yannick Ngakwe, I think. He does a good job generating some pressures, horrifically bad run defender, and that's it. He is... You would probably consider him barely a number one edge rusher, assuming you don't give a crap about anything but pass rush, which I think is a fair assessment if if you wanted to go down that road. But again, he wants top five money. So, you know, look, if the Bears want to waste all their money, or the Vikings, or the Lions, it's not great for us. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you want to be a really, really talented football team, you need... You want the ratio of talent to cost to weigh much heavier toward the talent side. That's the thing with the salary cap. So in a way, there's almost sort of a game in which you want your opponents to overpay. Because yes, they have burns now, and that's not the greatest thing in the world. But that only leaves this amount of money over here, which isn't very much. So, I don't know. It's probably going to get resolved, but there's just so many guys that are sitting out and waiting. And there was also a report apparently last year there were two teams that offered um, offered stuff. And, and this would actually be the other. Now I kind of want them to. I want the Bears to go get Brian Burns because apparently there was an offer. Let me see if I can find it really quick. So according to Ari Mirov over at My Sports Update, he says the Rams offered multiple first round picks and more for Burns before last year's trade deadline, only for Carolina to decline. The Bears wanted Burns in offers for the uh, number one overall pick, but Carolina made it clear he's off limits. And then they got the consolation prize of DJ Moore. I'll tell you what, if they're going to give away a first-round pick and pay the dude, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm kind of on board with that. Because the, the, the only thing that scares me right now about the Bears is the accumulation of picks. You're going to give away picks for a, a, a good, not great pass rusher and give away a bunch more of your salary cap like you did to a freaking linebacker? I don't know, man. Maybe you should do it. Maybe you should pull the trigger on it. We'll see. A couple other little nuggets that I found uh, perusing around. You've got the uh, football morning in America thing. You know the thing. Peter King does. Anyways, uh, one of the things he did was predict who was going to be in the playoffs. He's got the AFC with the Jacksonville Jaguars actually as the number one seed, which would be pretty wild. Kansas City as the number two seed. He said, Chris Jones, the, the holdout worries me a little bit. Has the New York Jets as the number three seed at 11 and six. Cincinnati at 11 and six. Buffalo 11 and six. Baltimore 10 and seven. And then Pittsburgh 9 and eight. So none of that, aside from the exclamations I put in, are all that uh, crazy. He even goes on to predict from there. 
says the Kansas City Chiefs will beat the New York Jets. The Buffalo Bills uh, will beat the Jacksonville Jaguars. Then in the AFC Championship, you got the Buffalo Bills beating the Kansas City Chiefs. All right, so then he goes to the NFC. He's got the San Francisco 49ers at 13-4. and four. I really wish they would just stop being good. They're very similar to the Chiefs where I look at them. I'm like, dude, you're not that freaking good. Stop being so good. You don't have a quarterback. You're not allowed to be this good. Philadelphia second at 12 and 5. Detroit at 10 and 7. At 10 and 7. He says, I buy the hype. Fair enough. Then Atlanta at 9 and 8, because they're going to win that division, but they suck. Dallas at 11 and 6. Seattle at 10 and 7. None of this is all that uh, surprising. But then the seventh and final team getting into the playoffs is the Green Bay Packers at 10 and 7. He does go on to say dart throwing the uh, they edge the nine and eight Giants on the basis of Jordan Love playing B minus football and an ascending defense. I tell you what, man, say what you want to say. You put the Packers at ten and seven and in the playoffs in the first year, even though in the wild card they have Philadelphia beating Green Bay. Okay, not that big of a shock. That makes sense if Philadelphia is that team. By the way, if they're not, it probably would be San Francisco, which also would kind of suck. But man, it'd be great to get some. Anyways, whatever. It doesn't matter. I would rather lose to Philadelphia than the 49ers if we're going to lose. I know Philly's not great. Their fans suck. And I'm sure I'm going to have... Oof, I can't imagine the amount of hatred we're all going to have for Philly if it ever comes down to Green Bay and Philly. Like, if that becomes a rivalry, which it might be with Jordan, you know, he's got to have his thing. Because there's such a garbage fan base. Like, I get into it with Bears fans and all these other fan bases. But Philly fans, oh, that's going to be brutal. Anyways, Detroit over Seattle, Dallas over Atlanta... Then he has Dallas beating San Francisco, Philly beating Detroit, and then Philadelphia beating Dallas 23-16. So Philadelphia and Buffalo in the Super Bowl. I actually wouldn't mind that. Again, I don't like the fans, but I can't bring myself to hate the team. I don't know why. I I just can't. I actually used to be that way about the Bears. Now I don't like the, the team very much, but I used to respect the Bears as a team, just couldn't stand their fan base. I don't know. I'm weird that way. Anyways, he has Philadelphia winning the Super Bowl 32-26. But again... As a Packer fan, of course the goal is to win a Super Bowl, obviously. That's what it's all about. And no, I don't want to lose to Philadelphia in the playoffs. That's not an ideal situation. But you tell me that we're 10-7 and and we get into the playoffs in year one of of this whole ordeal. Man, I'm feeling good about that. I really am. Just, Just based on how much it's going to crush everybody that's just wanting this demise of Green Bay to happen. It's like, nope, just a little blip. Basically did exactly what we would have done if we had Aaron Rodgers. You're telling me if Aaron was here, we'd be do much better than 10-7 and 7 and losing to Philadelphia? I don't think so. Maybe we'd be in the Detroit seat and actually win. Although it's hard to argue that considering we just didn't last year. But what I mean, broken thumb, I guess, maybe changes everything. But then we go up against Seattle, and that's a team we're probably going to win. That's just one of those things that we win. But then we play Philadelphia after that, and we're going to lose to Philly. So it is what it is. Although, again... Jordan Love, Aaron Rodgers couldn't get it done against Philly. Jordan comes in and it's like, dude, he freaking just put up some points out of nowhere. It wasn't good enough, especially thanks to our defense letting them continue to score points. But uh, he was was getting it done against that Philly D. He also has uh, Matt LaFleur as a potential coach of the year. He's got Doug Peterson number one uh, in Jacksonville, which makes sense if they do end up having a good amount of success. Dan Campbell in Detroit, which I don't know. I get it on one hand, and on the other hand, it's like, dude, it's been how many years, and you're going to get coach of the year because you finally limped into the playoffs? Freaking congratulations. Then we got ESPN. They did kind of a uh, ranking all the teams. They had us 24th, which I couldn't care any less about anybody's opinion, less than I care about ESPN. Like, if you talk about an entity, they're just trash, but whatever. They have us 24th. Um, They have the Packers' chances of winning the NFC North 14%. That feels low. I mean, I guess all things being equal would be 25%, and yeah, I don't like that. Chances to make the playoffs, 33%. Projected wins, 7.7. Strength of schedule, ninth easiest schedule. Then they've got their experts. Of course, Rob Domofsky is the ESPN guy for the Packers. Talks about packing. Blocking is their best thing. Biggest weakness is the young receivers, which as I've said already, youth is not a weakness. A lack of talent is a weakness, and we don't know if there's a lack of talent. All the best wide receivers are young. Amon Ross St. Brown is young. Justin Jefferson is young. Justin Jefferson was one of the best wide receivers in football as a rookie, and he broke all the rookie receiving records until the very next year when Jamar Chase came in and did the same freaking thing. He broke those records. He was young. Youth is not a bad thing. It's not. 
a lack of talent is a bad thing. Now, you can say that there are parallels between inexperience and not being good, but there's certainly not direct parallels based on what I just said. So, and, and also, there, there are strengths and weaknesses. I've talked about this already. More youth means more athleticism. It means less injuries. It means you're playing stronger into the fourth quarter and into the back end of the, of the, uh, the season. So, that being the biggest weakness? No, Rob, I'm not in on that. I'm sorry. A lot of the best players in the NFL are young. I'm so tired of people saying youth is a weakness. That's so stupid. Can you see the NFL? Can you, do you, are you able to watch what's going on over there? Best pass rusher in football. Is he 29 years old? No, he's 24-year-old Micah Parsons, who was just as good when he was 23 and a rookie. One of the best quarterbacks in the entire NFL is Joe Burrow. The only guy that's better than him would be Pat Mahomes. And Pat Mahomes got a real big contract real early into his rookie deal. You know why? Because he was elite right out of the gate. These are not old quarterbacks. They're young quarterbacks. And they were good even when they were younger. Joe Burrow's just 26. He's going into year four. Josh Jacobs is 25 years old. He's going into year five. He had an 87 PFF grade as a rookie in 2019. We're talking 21 years old. He's not going to get better as he gets older. He, in fact, he didn't. If you just look at his grades, he didn't get better every year. He just stayed awesome. It's just, it's just, it's such a dumb critique. I just don't like it. I don't mind critiquing the Packers. There's plenty of things to critique, but it's so stupid to just say, oh, the biggest weakness? Well, they're young. What does that mean? Are they good is the question. That's the question. Not are they young. That doesn't mean anything. So dumb. Another dumb stat that they put here. Stat to know. Just for everybody trying to get caught up on the Packers here. What is the potential ceiling for Love in 2023 after he played sparingly in his first three career seasons? Since 1950, the most touchdown passes by a quarterback in his fourth career season after starting one or fewer games in their first three seasons is 28, done by Aaron Rodgers. So that's his ceiling. He can't do better than that. Because Rodgers did it. How many quarterbacks do you think fit that freaking criteria? It's year four. You're starting for your team. Oh, and by the way, in the previous three seasons, you've only started one or fewer games. I don't know the answer. I spent a good amount of time trying to find the answer. I don't know the answer, but I kind of know the answer, and it's not that many. So, also kind of dumb. Then they have the fantasy sleeper candidate as Jaden Reed. Uh, Bowen, whoever that is, that was his prediction. I don't necessarily know. Well, he says, there's a path for Reed to see consistent volume as a slot target for Love. Reed can track the ball vertically, and he's also been deployed as a middle-of-the-field target on defined play-action throws in Coach Matt LaFleur's offense where he can use his catch and run ability. I, it's not impossible. My, my whole thing with Jaden Reed is I feel at some point he will end up being a better version of what Romeo Dobbs currently is. But that's the problem. This is what Romeo Dobbs currently is. So... From a fantasy standpoint, I'm not telling you not to go Jaden Reed, because I'm sure you can get him for basically free, but fantasy sleeper candidate? I mean, I don't know how you define sleeper, I guess. I haven't been plugged in enough to know who's being slept on, but it sounds like Romeo Dobbs would be the guy, because I know Christian Watson's going relatively high, and I don't know that Dobbs doesn't have a better season than Christian Watson at this point. And if you're not going to go that route, if you're looking for a sleeper, I think Musgrave could probably be a pretty good option. Jane Reed would maybe be next on that list, but it's a little further down for me. And then we have bold prediction for 2023. The Packers will win the NFC North. Is it so far fetched? Love is supported by a strong offensive line, has at least one good receiver in Watson. This team has real talent defensively too, and LaFleur got more than expected out of the Packers roster prior to last season. It is a little funny. I mean, obviously these are all different people with different projections compared to what a computer says, but we have 33% chance of making the playoffs. And then the bold prediction is they're going to make the playoffs. So that's ESPN for you. Anyways, I wanted to uh, get into some of the comments from the locker room stuff, but that's probably going to take some time. We'll save that for tomorrow. A um, couple of the guys made some statements that should be discussed, but I do have to get going. You guys have a good rest of your day. I will talk to you uh, tonight if we get enough calls. Do we have any calls right now? I checked this morning and there were actually zero, which kind of doesn't surprise me, I guess, because it's weird how dead this feels. You know, like we were in the dead season and it felt like there was plenty to talk about. Now we are not really in the dead season, but I, it's like there's, I don't know. So 
Not a lot of calls are up to three. Not enough for a uh, Packer Net After Dark. Maybe for for you tonight, depending on how many calls. But I'm obviously referring to last night. Anyways, I guess I'm just saying I get it. Just want it to come. Just, just please hurry up. That is not what she... Never mind. You guys have a good rest of your day. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.